part of this series is really connecting Bridgewater back to the alumni who have come in through our doors and shaped so much of who we are today and how we can both celebrate them and their accomplishments, but also learn from their perspective and wisdom. Mike, we're so excited to have you and welcome back. Dave, Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Good to have you back. I, um, I'm really uh, delighted and really proud of, uh, proud of what you've been doing since you left, but, but really proud of this book, which is, uh, I know we've talked about it a bunch of times. I know it's been a labor of love and uh, I don't know when you were halfway through it, whether if you had a do-over, you would have uh, decided to continue, continue or not. Uh, but, but so much to talk about. Um, and I thought I'd start with um, Bridgewater uh, and uh, kind of reflections on Bridgewater with a couple years uh, with Bridgewater a couple years into your re- rearview mirror, and I remember uh, you and I meeting uh, in a conference room in Nyala. Uh, I, I forget exactly when that was, but you were talking about options uh, that you were thinking about next, and and I I think I said, oh, what about Bridgewater? And I think that that sort of got us into a different conversation, which ended up being a, a great thing for for you, I hope, and certainly a great thing for us. But, um, but how, did you, how did you end up here? What were you thinking when you left the Navy after uh, 20 years and, and how did you end up at Bridgewater? Yeah, first of all, thank you, Dave, for having me, Greg, Robin. So awesome to see you in the Hollywood squares, the world we live in and the overwhelming number of like chats and hello, hello, uh, just a super warm high five hugs all around. And um, someday we'll get to do that again live. But a uh, quick answer is really the reason I landed at Bridgewater was because of you and Greg. And so in the, in the community, the um, I had, you know, I was in a program called the White House Fellowship. I was a director for defense policy and strategy. I reported to the national security advisor who reports to the president. And I was trying to figure out what do I do after that fellowship? And it was returned to the SEALs for a few years. But I got to cross paths quickly with Dave, who had uh, worked with a White House fellow classmate of mine. What Dave, even to this day, doesn't know is that this guy, Everett Spain, who, of course, you'll smile when I say his name, said, hey, I get to work with this guy at Treasury who's like the fastest effing runner that you'll ever meet. And it was nothing about the guy's brain or anything like that. It was like, he used to be a ranger, you know, he's super cool. He's like really a good dude. And, um, and uh, anyways, long story short, after getting ready to transition out of the SEALs, I had options at Goldman and JPM. And I, I, was, I called Dave for advice. I still remember from Virginia Beach. And he said, hey, you know, this, let's have a live conversation. Uh, you know, was in that conference room that Dave just talked about. And then uh, like an hour later, I got to meet Greg. And between Dave and Greg, I walk, walked away feeling like, first of all, two really incredible people. That's not just like the flip, uh, gratuitous bullshitty things that you say out in the real world about people. Like that's really what I think. And so um, then, uh, you know, it was really a matter of where are you going to get the most growth from? And so as I was thinking after being you know, raised, raised in the SEALs, Bridgewater was, has way more in common with the SEALs than not. And that, that culture of leaning into the hardest thing, of trying the hardest thing, total ambiguity, and just doing your best to, to contribute to an organization. I mean, that, that's really ultimately how I landed, landed at Bridgewater and I loved it and I'm a proud alum. That's great. Thank you. I'm so glad you worked in my fa- how fast I could run into your answer. I, I very, very, really appreciate that. Um, you know, the SEALs are known for being um, a really idiosyncratic uh, community and Bridgewater is known for uh, being a, a really idiosyncratic uh, community. How, how would you compare the two? And uh, what, what was the same and what's different? Great. The same is the easiest place to start. You know, when we come off of an operation in the SEALs that looks like it could be the front page of the paper, we don't talk about what went well. Inertia has that go well, is more likely to go well in the future than not. The highest ROI on our time is always talking about what didn't go well. And that was our culture. And so it's, um, and it's also a culture, a meritocratic culture where that 21 year old new seal might have the best idea and say, Hey, sir, I think you, you know, you're not thinking about this the right way. Let's think about this a different way. What about X, Y, Z, that kind of challenge authority type of, um, of culture and environment is what keeps people alive in the seals. And I think, you know, of course I was on the management side, but I think I feel confident enough saying that's what helps you win in markets. It starts with having a great organization. And then below that, having all the pieces of that, whether it's the IAs, the MAs, the, you know, te- technologists, HR, et cetera, just come together as one team. So the similarity is more culture centric. The biggest difference is almost the other side of that coin. 
and this is something that Greg and I kind of you know fought over uh, over the years about. It's um, you know I think that the concept of leadership is has a little bit of a short term and a longer term component to it. A lot of times I felt like we could achieve both our whatever goals we had in front of us with being. Um, I don't know, maybe optimizing more for getting people personally motivated and maybe a little more optimization for like harmony, not in a avoid the conflict kind of way, but a, you can have your cake and eat it too. You don't need this mutually exclusive kind of organization. And, and um, you know, Greg's answer, I, I, I can, he said it to me a million times, was like, hey, look, you know, I'm trying to help the organization get better over the long run. And I'm thinking about the five, 10, 20 year Bridgewater, not the in the moment thing that you're thinking of. So I'm not sure, you know, I never, I always could appreciate Greg's point of view. I didn't, we didn't always agree. We would battle back and forth on different situations. And, um, and, and so that was kind of that, am I alone on an island? Does it really have to be this freaking hard was kind of some of the, the things that was different at Bridgewater. Yeah. Well, I want to, I want to go to that more because, um, you know, we, we, uh, we've had, uh, you've had an incredible set of leadership experiences and, and Bridgewater being one of them. And, you know, I, I was a part of lots of conversations with, with you and Greg, but also you and I and you and Ray, uh, where there'd be a lot of, uh, of back and forth on leadership. What, what um, you know, how did Bridgewater shape your, le- your leadership thinking? And what, um, what, was, what was the good you would take away from it? And what was, um, you know, more to, to the point, what was the bad? What, would, what were the things that uh, you thought needed to change or could evolve? Yeah, well, the, the good's the easy part. It's, um, it's really the structured thinking. I was much more of a, you know, intuitive, messierish kind of thinker before Bridgewater. And in the classic way, if you would have asked me that before I got to Bridgewater, I actually would have thought I was pretty good, you know? And so, but we, all of a sudden, you know, iron sharpens iron. And so all of a sudden, when you're in a room with really sharp iron, you get more logical, faster, et cetera. And I'm not saying I was ever, you know, off the charts, uh, you know, uh, on any of those, but, but man alive, that, that being around the, the average of the people we hang out with. So when you hang out with people that are smarter, faster, stronger, we become more of the same. And that's what I think was really, really the awesome part. And, and it's not always fun in the moment, but it, it's what makes the place really special. And then I, I think my answer on the flip side of that really is the, it can be fun also. Because when you're do, when the the delivery of feedback is always um, it's always caring, but some people see it as caring uh, more. E- some people deliver it, and others see it as caring more easily than others. And I think that's something that that Bridgewater could always be more mindful of. Because you know, I will argue my short term harmony ish thing. You don't need to sacrifice much of the 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 goal in front of us to to have a a, a nicer, more team spirited kind of organization. Yeah, and is there anything specific as, as we're thinking about Bridgewater for the future? Um, is there anything more specific you'd suggest on that in terms of it, the, the way people are interacting or the way people are coaching? Um, how, how might the care manifest itself more? I, I, I agree with you. I think there's a lot of caring. And the question is how to express that caring while also you know, having the iron sharpen iron. Yeah, the quick answer that I would say to that is don't let it just be the superficial, meaningful relationships in air quotes, and then try to dress something up as meaningful relationships, but do the work behind it. You know, it, it's, it's like never miss one of the, the things that I regret most in life is missing the opportunity to call a friend who ended up killing himself, you know, and, um, and uh, you know, he took my job overseas and it was, it's, it's uh, in fact, I spoke to his, spoke to his wife last night, but um it's, it's something that weighs on me forever. And the, um, and, and so the, the aspect in and around the, um, what could be, what could be done better, like really actually do the meaningful work to have the meaningful relationship. Like the work isn't like the, the wire and the client interface or the running the operations internally. The work is number one, perceiving when somebody has the hard day. And number two, actually doing something about it. It's, it's that second part. It's, it's, it takes both of those things to really move the needle. And then people really know you're, you, you care. I mean, we're talking about like an alumni network. I think about a network. Well, let me back up. I think a lot of people on the planet think about a network as a transactional thing. Somebody's better placed than you are. You go get their business card at some 16 minute event and you think you've had a successful networking event. Complete bullshit. You know, the, a network is a group of people in whom you invest and then when you need something, that group that you've put energy into easily can give it back to you because it's not transactional. It's genuine. Yeah, that's a great way to think about it. 
That's a great way to think about it. It's just sort of a different version of mentoring where people can mentor each other at different points and times in, in, uh, in kind of unique ways. Um, let me turn to the seals because the seals uh, shaped a, a lot of your views on the world, but also as a, a, a big part of the book. What, what uh, you know, unlike me, you were a, a, a normal college kid and could, could have had been living the normal college kid experience and you decided to sign up for Navy ROTC and then, um, and then go into the seals. What, what made you do that? There's a simple answer and, a, and then a, a, a more practical answer. The, um, the practical answer is I was the oldest of four. Father was in the military and, and, you know, just how do you, and I had a scholarship. So how do I keep my parents able to pay for school for the next three? But the, but the real reason is it is about service to others and it's about making the world better. I think that, you know, my grandfather was at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 41 on that day of infamy and an incredible example. He never once told me what, what I should do. He told me how I should be and who I should be. And it's that always building the foundation, perfect parallel for Bridgewater. It's like, don't worry, we've got the rest of our lives to build the wall on the roof, the, the walls and the roof. It's, it's really like, how do you keep building that foundation and stronger and stronger? And so the, the, the examples that my grandfather set for me and, and implicitly said on me was all about contribution. You know, when I got commissioned out of ROTC, I'll never forget him, you know, actually pulling me aside and, um, and stepping forward and putting his, his hand on my shoulder and, and looking me square in the eyes. And he said, son, uh, you know, don't, don't die for your country, go on living for it. And, you know, I, I've been through a lot of situations where, you know, I've, 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 I've been shot at, I've been rocketed, I've been run over by a carnival cruise liner, I've jumped out of a building rig to explode, I've, you know, helped amputate a teammate's leg, like, and I've buried way too many friends. And, and ultimately, that's what the book is about is, is trying to give back and then donating all the profits to, to those families. Yeah, well, as you know, I had a chance to read the book in, in an earlier uh, form when it was just a, tra a transcript. Uh, so I, I remember a number of the great stories from your, your time as a SEAL. Uh, you talk a lot about calmness um, when, um, when kind of the shit hits the fan. And so I wanted to ask you a bit about that uh, and, and, and what advice you have on maintaining calm. And I wondered if there's any, and there's so much in the book, and I really, I want to recommend people read it and Bridgewater's purchase books for anyone who wants to read it. But um, I wonder if you might pick, pull one story, any story from the book that you think would be, um, would be interesting and, um, and, and uh, you know, a lesson for this crowd. Yeah, I think the essence of the lesson is calm breeds calm and excitement breeds excitement. And so, you know, when you're getting, when you're getting shot at or something bad is happening to you, if you let your brain go to all of the, 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 the extra things that you don't need to be processing and, and the, thinking about all the thousands of possibilities of all the things that could go wrong, you're wasting your, your CPU. You know, all you need to be thinking about is very narrowly, like what's the outcome you're trying to achieve? And then what are all the paths that you can get you there? And then how do you risk adjust those paths as best you can and, 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 and mitigate as much of the risk as you can so that you can find that easiest and best path to the goal. So, um, you know, the, the, um, a, a quick story, when there was one particular night running a special operations task force, 2000 people where, uh, you know, our guys were, were heavily engaged with the Taliban and, um, and ultimately the weather came in and, you know, we had 10 leaders, whether that means that the helicopters couldn't fly, supporting planes couldn't fly. It's not good to be a ground person, a, a ground guy, when all of a sudden you can't get supporting assets from the air. You know that better than anybody, Dave, but for the group, that's you, you, our job in the SEALs is to never fight fair. It's, it's how do we stack the odds through planning both for what we have and what I would describe as kind of the meta plan for the ability to change the plan in the moment. Like SEALs go in with a plan, but our plan is for that plan to change. And so we try to stay ready for that change. And that's that agility thing. But, but this particular night required lots of agility because our, um, we, I had to sit back in the, ta in the, the task force and, and, and think about all the things that, that um, could happen that weren't happening. You know, when we get busy, we get attracted to that positive space and all the busyness and nobody slows down and can think about that negative space. 
And so that's where all the risk and all the opportunity is, is in that unknown unknown quadrant. And so, and then the question becomes, how do you get that risk and opportunity out of the unknown unknown quadrant and back into that positive space in front of you so that you can deal, sort through it, deal through it, prioritize it and create action plans or whatever. So I'm kind of explaining both how my brain was thinking and then what the story itself. So I'm kind of munging those two things. Um, I'm, I'm sure uh, people are going to want to come back to your seal time because there's a, there's a lot there that's interesting. And so I want to encourage people who are listening to, to put your questions in the chat and I'm going to um, spend another 20 minutes with Microsoft and then I'm going to turn to those questions and, uh, and, and draw them into the conversation. But, um, but let's go from kicking down doors in Afghanistan to walking down the hallway in, in the, uh, in the old executive office building uh, and the white house. And uh, you, you, you go from, uh, from, a number of combat tours to being a White House fellow, and you land in the National Security Council. And you're, if I'm understanding, uh, if I'm remembering it right, you're uh, you're all of a sudden negotiating defense treaties uh, on behalf of on behalf of the president. And just the content shifting, the differences, um, the the nuance versus the clarity of Afghanistan. Tell tell us about that transition, what that was like, why you did that, and uh, and what did you learn. Yeah, well, it starts with my interview process. Uh, the you remember probably remember Jim Jeffrey. He was the deputy national security advisor for for everybody. So, I as a White House fellow interviewed with um, this you know stoic gravitasi legend of a of a policymaker and M Ambassador Jeffrey to me. He wasn't Jim at the time. The uh, small little West Wing. David was downstairs in the the next to the national security advisors in that little in that little corner cubby. And uh, I was sitting there probably because of space, probably four feet from the man. And he said, hey, Mike, this is a real position. I'm interviewing two real people from Washington, D.C. with real careers. Uh, and, um, and so, you know, I, I don't know that you're right for this job. And uh, he said, for example, what do you know about the START Treaty? And I looked him square in the eyes, deadpan, but totally serious answer was, sir, I know how to spell it. <laughs> and in that moment, you know, I think most people would either like flounder or, or fake it. And I was like, Hey, just be real. And, um, and so while the, the thing, the thing that I didn't let flounder was more going to the process, you know, sure. You don't have to know the thing in front of you. You have to be able to run a process, which really is, you know, then fast forward the clock nine days or something like that into my time at the white house. I was at the head of the table in the big sit room, which you know, so well, people from all departments and agencies around the table who couldn't agree because there were a bunch of binary issues that were hard to, it's hard to compromise on issues that are a one or a zero, you know, international structures of texts for lawyers, uh, telemetry of rockets, how much we give away our telemetry for, you know, whether you're an intelligence person or an energy person. And so I don't know, there's all these arguments that I knew literally nothing about. And so it's kind of like, um, I, I think, you know, uh, it, it's like um, Stuart Friedman I, I saw on in, um, it's, I, I always heard Stuart say something great, American Idol is like, hey, I can't sing, but in six seconds, I can tell if you can sing. And so um, it's the same thing. Like, I can't sing, but in that sit room, I can tell when someone else could sing. We got a treaty together, went and flew overseas. And, um, and, and, and then the lesson there really was, uh, number one is having the humility to answer like what you, what you really, the comfort with what you don't know, and then how to handle that. Yeah, th th three believable parties. Did that ever come into the? Uh... <laughs> yeah, you know, and it was funny. And then Jim Jeffrey broke his iPad out and started dotting me. So I was I, you know. good to hear. Good to hear. Well, that was that was an exciting year, and uh, you did the, you did lots of things. You cut across two administrations, didn't you? Or were you only? Yeah, you cut no, across I, Bush and Obama, right? Yep, yep. And how was that? What was it like as the as the president? turned over did it did it really change anything for you did it really feel different surprisingly yes so um so all the people who who um really knew that i didn't know what i was talking about they all went home and so then when new people came in i could fake it a little bit easier so yeah. i tricked the new people into thinking that i actually knew what i was talking about uh but in all sincerity um i was actually surprised by a couple things and and impressed by a couple things the the, the surprise was that you know, I would have thought two different parties would have changed more from a policy perspective. Separate the world into policy and process. You know, it's it's the what and the how. The on the what itself, it was like I would have thought eighty percent changed, maybe twenty percent changed. On the process, which worked damn good before, I would have thought the inverse. 
And, um, and so Obama came in and changed like his administration, not him personally, but changed 80% of the process and 20% of the policy. So that was a little bit of a surprise. And then I think the, 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 the great thing in the, the characterization between the two was seeing a new group of people come in with a lot of energy was a lot different, you know, at year seven and a half versus, you know, month one of an administration, you know, better than anybody, Dave, it just feels different. There's a new energy, you know, there were like 24 year olds, I'll date myself here, but I, I mean, at the time I was 35 or I'm 49 now, I was probably 35 ish or whatever, but, you know, people, you know, walking around with two Blackberries and having a conversation at the same time and, you know, just multitasking and all of a sudden things were moving and it just felt like a new energy in town and that, that felt really great. And, 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 and I actually did kind of know what I was talking about. And then a month in, I, I handled a big, you know, a big situation for the president and, and it, and it went well. And, and then, and then I got asked to do more and more, which is always fun. Yeah. Interesting. And, uh, and so just to transition past Bridgewater into, uh, you know, after you left Bridgewater, you decided to write this book. Why did you decide to write it? And I, I know it's, it's organized around three pillars. Um, so I want to ask you to describe what, you know, what made you take this on? Cause it's not a small thing to write a book like this and, and do it as well as you have. And then what, what are the, what's the key message that you wanted to share with your readers? Yeah, I, I think the, the main reason I wrote the book was to share and give back. You know, I I've lived a life of privilege that, and been in hard and excellent and terrible situations that very few people get a chance to have. And including working at Bridgewater, like how many people get to work at Bridgewater? It's an incredible privilege. And, and so like, I feel like I've learned a lot through life and I'm, I wanted to, to give back like the, the actual things that are in the book and then trying to create like win, win, wins. It's also, you know, donating all the, the profits to a cause near and dear to my heart, which is like we said earlier, really gold star families. You know, I, I've, I've buried far too many friends and, and that still hurts. I wake up early on too many mornings thinking about, you know, different people who aren't here and things that maybe I could have done better. Um, and, uh, and so I kind of live a lifelong obligation, self, self, you know, um, imposed of course, but uh, to, to really take care of a lot of those families. I, I, there are a lot of greatly um, intentioned veterans and people out in the ecosystem, but I feel like where I am and what I've been able to do, it's on me to kind of asymmetrically give back. It's the, to those who much has been given, much is expected. And so how do you rise up and, and, and not just meet, but exceed those self-imposed standards on giving back? And I think also it kind of ties a little bit to the pandemic, Dave, which is, you know, it, these are hard times. You know, and, and I think about it on an absolute and a relative basis. It's absolutely harder but the important thing is to remember is that on a relative basis, like at, like in a SEAL team, like at Bridgewater or out in for 325 million Americans or whatever number we're at now, it's there's there's life is relative. And so like when you're having a hard day, the, you can either do one of two things. You can focus on yourself and your hard day, or you can find somebody who's having a harder day and go help that person. And if you do the latter, it makes life a lot better. And so I think that that's that's kind of my approach through it. And related to that, you've got this saying about uh, uh, this sucks. Let's stay here. What, what exactly do you mean by that? Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's it's the principle of uh, leaning into those those hard things, and 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 failure is only failure if you fail and don't learn, right? And so the um, this particular story, and this is this is how the book came about. Like I was in Kosovo in '97 and leading a team of five, me plus five people like doing reconnaissance to enforce the Dayton peace accords, which people may or may not remember, but it was to keep basically separate Serbians and, and Kosovar um, Albanians, different religions, different people, decades of, of conflict. All we were really doing was re reporting on the ground. The SEALs mission was to figure out what was happening and get ground truth. Well, there was one particular evening where uh, we were doing our three day, four day operations and the time of year is, you know, of course, 20 degrees below, it was like just enough snow to need, you know, more than snowshoes, but less than skiing kind of thing, just really just shitty, shitty humanless conditions. And you just want to lay up uh, on, in a place that's going to be comfortable, like some trees, something flat, some, and, and, um, and, and everybody won't pick, wanted to pick this one area. And I said, no, 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 we got to go up this hill, up this incline, like another 30, 40 meters off this kind of like natural, what we call a natural line of drift, which a natural line of drift is just where humans walk, like naturally, a train tracks, you know, you know, just 
where people, the natural path will go. So we moved 30 or 40 meters off that, that area and look in the middle of nowhere, the chances of anybody coming through was like nil, but then, um, but it, then it wasn't nil. Cause after we got set up like an hour later, there were no kidding 400 or so Albanian army folks that came marching straight through that area. And they literally would have come right over the top of us. And so, you know, we got really quiet. We let them go by, nothing happened. And I was like, Hey, there's a new, there's a new lesson. This sucks. Great. Let's stay here. <laughs> and, uh, and take us back to the book for a minute. And I want to connect the book uh, and the three pillars a little bit to Bridgewater and, um, and, and what, what you think we should take from the book. And uh, maybe you could talk a minute about the pillars and then wh which, of, which of them you think most uh, apply. Well, the three pillars are excellence, agility, and meaning. It's not like the only framework that I use in life, but it was just an organizing set of kind of like thinking for the, the, what I was trying to convey. I think excellence, I, I often think you're only excellent if you know you're never excellent enough. Nothing to do with age or seniority. It's just fire in the gut. How much fire do you have? If you know you're never excellent enough, you're always striving and always trying to get better. The second thing, agility. It's really the ability to you know, move forward and move backward dynamically. In the SEALs, I kind of called it dynamic subordination. It, it's, it, of course, you think very military centric when you hear aren't Rangers, SEALs, whatever, couldn't be further from the truth. We find the best person who is best placed for doing the thing in front of us to be the right person to be the leader. And I might be the highest rank, but I'm the follower. And, and so like, that's where I, I, the principles around, like I said, like leaders need, need to not only be able to lead and follow, but most importantly, know when to do which. So that's the key thing. And so I just grew up with all these things around agility that I wanted to convey because I think that there are a lot of points that people miss around seniority or self-importance or who should be making the decision. You know, I was, one of the questions I was ready for Maria Bartiromo on the other morning was, um, was um, hey, what do you think of the Biden administration? My answer would have been uh, thinking more about like anything but the what, just think about the how and the who should make the decision. Well, I mean, you know, the, of course, one of the raised principles or other coined like the, the, whatever it was, like the who comes first or whatever that was, but that's, that's the thinking about the process of where will the decision-making lie. So again, lots of principles around agility. And then the last part I think is the most important in the main message, which is around meaning and impact. I think a lot of us just go through life, just getting bogged down by the busy, the wire that's sitting right in front of us. Those situations that you deal with, like how are you on the front lines of, of dealing with um, the ability to step back, pause, have that quiet reflection time and think, what is meaning? What is impact and how do I have it? And um, just doing the mental exercise that we all know intellectually, but very rarely do, which is doing that like, if my life ended now, you know, what, what, what contribution have I made? And, and of course that there's a little bit of bias in that statement in and of itself, that contribution is important. It could be amassing personal wealth. It could be public recognition or fame or whatever drives different people, but, um, but whatever meaning and impact is to an individual, I didn't want to predefine what impact and meaning is for anybody, but just, but the point is do the thinking and have your plan so that you can, you can mark yourself to market. You know, it's, it's uh, in econ in grad school, I remember my professor saying, hey, Mike, beware of fast trains to the wrong station. And so, you know, thinking about what station are we trying to get to in life? Yeah. I'm going to ask you one more question, and then I'm going to open it up to the, uh, to, to the audience. Um, agility. And um, I want, want you to go a little bit deeper on agility within the context of Bridgewater, because one of the things I remember us talking about and you complaining about was your... Um, frustrations with the absence of agility or what you perceive to be the absence of agility at Bridgewater. And just um, tell us a little bit more about that. How, what's the uh, Bridgewater analog of uh, kicking down doors and, and how to, you know, move quickly and successfully, but also in a way that's consistent yeah. with high quality and excellence? It, it's, it's a great topic for Bridgewater. It's the, the things that I would sometimes feel frustrated by sometimes anywhere from sometimes to often, but never less than sometimes was are we overthinking something? You know, is the 80% solution or the 95% solution good enough and move on? And, or do you really need to do that 17,000 person, you know, turn on things and, you know, pull every last little thread? Look, I, I think there's a lot of learning that can be come from pulling different threads, 
but sometimes the, the, the actual learning is that you shouldn't pull the thread. You should call the work that, that part of work done and move on to the next thing. So the agility really is keeping from getting bogged down in the process because you think it's the process's sake. And I know that there's, I know uh, from conversations with you, Greg, you know, some with Ray on this, you, that's not the intention. And uh, Greg and I had nonstop conversations around, you know, bureaucracy busting and saying, how do we get under this? How do we, how do we a in, identify an inventory and then sort through the things? Because it would pain Greg to know. I'd see the pain when he's talking to some, you know, 22 year old IA or, or, and they're, you know, dealing with tools that don't work or different thing, or there's too many administrative requirements. And all you want to do is give people lift so they can work in their comparative advantage. And that's like the MA's job, right? Is to say like, how do we really be the oil in the engine? And that's what I always kind of carried my job as is like, how do I be that oil? It's not seen in the engine, but it makes the engine go and, um, and, and helps provide things. So I think not, I think avoiding getting bogged down is also a, 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 my answer around agility. Good. Um, I'm going to turn to a couple of questions from the audience. I'm going to start with, um, uh, with Naeem and he had a number of questions, but I'm going to pull out one, which is, uh, helping us think about uh, disagreement and um, expressing and forcefully arguing your point of view, but within the context of other decision makers. And, you know, you've had experience of this in the military, you've had experience of this uh, in the White House, you've had experience of this at Bridgewater and now in your next phase. How do you disagree effectively and how do you manage that when others make the decision? Yeah, I think the thing is to start with what's the other party's ability to be disagreed with and understand and think ahead to the combinations and permutations around how hard can or should you push? Because it's, it's kind of like I've led some big transformations. I, I did, I went, so I left Bridgewater, moved to Cognizant for four years, IT services firm, helped lead, lead a big transformation there, ran a $2 billion p &L for um, all IT services sold into financial services. So I've dealt with the JPMs, the Goldman's, the Amex, UBS, Credit Suisse, all these places. And so when, when you're thinking about transformation or changing things in the real world, it's, um, it's a function of, of, of understanding that elasticity of which that, whereby people can change and then, and then pushing people just hard enough. It's um, giving somebody 10% more weight in their backpack than they can carry, not 50% more weight because they're gonna crumble. And so being on that, that finding that trajectory that the, the, of maximum change versus, um, versus um, crumbling and under their own weight. Uh, Rick Sharma, I'm gonna to turn to you and, and why don't you come ask the question and, um, and others, please, uh, please put your questions in the chat room. Hey Mike, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Um, I miss having you around here. I'm sure a lot of us do. And I'm really proud to see uh, what you've done since you've left Bridgewater. Looking forward to reading the book. Um, wanted to kind of tie in your experience from a kind of national security perspective, but also, you know, the half decade of tech experience you've been investing in since you left Bridgewater and get your thoughts on what seems to be like the inevitable intersection of those two things, which is, yeah, you know, cyber warfare, the idea of this kind of bifurcated internet between a Western internet and let's say a Chinese driven internet and the involvement of governments in big tech as you're seeing with like the TikTok stuff that happened last year. And we just get, you know, want to get your thoughts on like what, what to expect as that kind of plays out over the next years and what you think the path through is. Yeah, it's a great, first of all, great to see you, Rick. Miss you too, man. So, so nice to hear your voice and, and see you semi-live. Um, look, I don't necessarily have the answers. I have one person's potential opinion or inputs or, or something, but I think the questions you're raising are, are definitely the most important, which is, do we want a binary polarized world, which can be argued, we, which we could be fooled into thinking is more secure? Look, I mean, in today's, in today's day and age, what is really secure? Look at the solar winds hack that just happened. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, um, well, let me simplify. Uh, not, uh, state actors uh, basically penetrated everything that we have via a, a, a US-based company and, and backdoored, and including 
um, you, including using multiple technology firms that are out there to get into government. So, you know, it, it, so when we look at this polarized binary world, I don't know, like I would ask somebody smarter than me and say, hey, why don't you look at the, um, the, the during the Cold War, where it was having, you know, really two worlds better or worse? You know, I think it's hard to disagree that the grit, that the greatest economic potential is when the world, the globe comes together and is able to work as one. You know, Dave just answered a great question on Bloomberg around China. You know, it's kind of like um, the, the the my playback of that would be basically, hey, there's no such thing in between Russia, China, U.S., EU of having any sort of to synthesize everything into one single view and synthesize something as a one or a zero is completely impossible and non nuanced. So the question is, then you come down a click and you start looking at um, things like cyber policy, like uh, all the different individual things. Um, I don't know, like uh, just say intellectual property for China as an example, or, or, or tariffs or whatever the case are, just start listing those things out and then have a strategy. Of course, you have to have a strategy at the highest level, but that strategy could be intentionally to create strategies one level down from that. And then, and then you don't have to live in a binary world anymore because you can go from like zero to a hundred on amounts of pressure or capitulation on each of those individual things. Now, like with the technology thing, I think it's, it's to answer the, the literal question, it's unquestionably um, bad for us to be, to, to be in not have non-secure products out there that, that have the ability to be penetrated. And so then the question is, what do you do in order to best safeguard that? I know e Igor is not on right now. Igor is a great, great friend of mine and, and of everybody on this call. He's ironically in a meeting with my CEO right now. So, um, so uh, you know, maybe we can each ba say bad things about each other. It'll be, uh, we'll both have great days. But anyways, Rick, that's, that's the, the gist of the answer is, is really trying to use all of our tools to create the greatest good while of course remaining secure. It's a really bullshitty Washington DC high level answer, but if, if there's follow-ups, I don't know. No, but thanks Mike. And I think especially the idea of like taking it that click down and that's just a great framework from taking something that seems like it's unable to be worked through and impenetrable to, to little pieces that you could deal with individually. I think that's a great way to think about it. Thanks. I'm going to turn to uh, Naeem again for a, a question, and then Robin, I know, has a question. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, Mike, I'm sorry our, uh, we didn't cross paths when you were here, but I downloaded the book uh, yesterday, and I started reading it, and it's, uh, it, it's so far, it's been great. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is a question that comes to mind a lot when I read books or listen to podcasts or talk to people who are either ex-military or ex-sports. And, uh, you know, at some level, it's very, uh, it, it sounds, you know, totally uh, conceivable that a lot of the leadership skills that work on a sports team or work in a military context and that sort of stuff, it sounds completely conceivable that they transfer very well to other contexts. But the thing that I've both experienced personally and, and you know, uh, always feel lacking in a lot of uh, the stuff that I've read and the people that I've talked to is like, man, the stuff like things like communicating, motivating, that stuff is very visceral. It's not academic. It's like, you know, and it's very context specific. Like the way you fire up troops in a, uh, on the field is different than the way that you fire up troops in a football locker room is very different than how you lead a, a, you know, an IA team or an investment engineering team here at Bridgewater. And so you've been in enough contexts and had enough roles that I'm sure you've, um, you've had to transfer this like very important skill around. And so I'm curious how you think about that and, um, you know, what sort of advice you may have for people who may have come from uh, like a different background uh, that, um, you know, feel like that is something that they would want to um, apply uh, in like a more of a corporate setting, but are struggling to have that um, skill transfer over easily. Thanks. Sure thing. So the first part of that would be around the, um, the really going back to the agility point earlier, you know, sorry, the, the, I, there's, there's so much packed in there that, that you really could go a hundred different ways. The high, the easiest way to say it is that high performance people and organizations are basically all the same. You know, that first 98% are all the foundation that we talked about earlier. You know, it's, it's, um, 
it's it's not the it's you know values ability skills right it's like so what are the values and the abilities don't worry as much about the skills it's kind of like I, I i hope i think it's what like greg maybe saw in me that first time that we met was like okay this guy doesn't know anything that we need to do but but i see a foundation here that can be helpful and so being able to a see ahead to that and then b is is be able to like match person to a job design or whatever that thing was but like like being able to say this is how a person can contribute is, is mostly for leaders a function of seeing it yourself and then helping the other person see it and translating that into, um, into actual contribution for an organization. That's the challenge of leadership. But the thing is, I know there's probably a lot of people who just come into Bridgewater. It is not an easy place to land, right? Because it's almost like the, the, um, you, can, you can paralyze yourself um, by getting spun around and not being sure about what you're supposed to do or how you're supposed to act. And the most, the thing that is most liberating is that third phase of a career when you no longer have anything to prove to anybody, you, you, you know, you've already, you've learned your trade and you know, you're good. You don't have to prove anything and you're comfortable standing in front of people and making mistakes and, and, um, and, and, and knowing you're not going to be judged. So I think the faster you can get to that third phase of like non-embarrassment, which is kind of also non-ego and, and, and total humility, and knowing that you're around people, that's really the key there, Naeem. Thanks, Robin. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, this has been so great to talk to you so far. I remember very vividly that from the time that you started, you were raising the idea that we ha were, had a huge missed opportunity of not taking advantage of our alumni network. In the last few years, as you know, we've, we've been building that out. This whole talk is part of that. I'd love to hear your, your experiences at, as an alumni and your reflections on looking at us from the outside in and how, how well we're doing at that. Yeah, well, first of all, let's start with the real, the, the real part of that question, which is I saw something and then couldn't get it done, and then you've got it done. So a million congratulations on that. You're infinitely better than I am. Um, the alumni network... I think has a couple of goals, right? It's just how do you think about reputation out in the, in the ecosystem, which is a little bit amorphous, but it's also that special, like, I don't know what's going to come with this, but good things will happen. A little bit of that, like just trust and, and let it, let it, let some good things will emerge from the ether. Uh, but then there's also the, like, do we have specific concrete goals? You know, I, I don't, I don't know, I don't see it, but I, I could imagine there are a bunch of relationships out in the world where when Bridgewater is trying to get an entry or an access or either go deeper with somebody they know or go, um, or go broader in areas where they aren't, do, do you think about mapping into that ecosystem and say, hey, I could use help. And, um, and I think that what we, anybody who's been around the block more than, you know, six minutes in their professional life understands that that really the way the world is built is by saying yes to that question and being ready to help when there's nothing in it for you. And that's really the essence of part of the essence of the book of never enough. And so that, that I think that creating that ecosystem that's out there is really powerful in ways that probably are mostly unpredictable. And it's, and I think that, um, but I think when there are specific asks, that might be something that, 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 that people keep in mind and maybe funnel to you or whoever the right person is, and then feel free to ask for that help. And so, uh, and then in the rearview mirror, look, tons of appreciation and gratitude. Like it was a hard place to work four years there, 2013 to 2017 or whatever. But, um, so some of the best people that I've worked with and, um, and, uh, and really like where I really grew in and around what we talked about earlier of that, like, like, um, you know, the, the, the clarity of thinking really dissecting a problem and being granular around, or like focus, I should say on on how to solve things. Even now I find myself like a hundred X faster than a lot of people that I work with. And then when I'm in a room at Bridgewater, I'm like the slowest. One of the great partnerships of, uh, of all time at Bridgewater was Mike and Greg and they both good friends and, um, and, uh, and good partners. So uh, Greg, I know you're on the line. Anything you want to add to this discussion? Well, just, um, Hey, thanks for coming back, Mike. It, I think you're, um, you know, the wisdom that you share, the, the way you approach life um, really had a big impact on me. And, and I think you sharing it with so many people, both through your book and through this is, is so cool. And, um, and so I think it's a, it's a real pleasure. I don't have any questions for you because you did such a good job describing um, your thoughts and, um, and I've had so much time for you with you, but, but I, um, but I really appreciate it and for everybody who doesn't know. I mean, Mike's commitment to others and his lack of ego are, are amazing and so I think um, everybody can, 
can take a little piece of this. And that's all the nice stuff I can say about Mike. We have a couple of time for a couple more questions. Um, I hope I get this pronunciation right. Kashaw, uh, I think you had a question for Mike. Hey, hey, Mike. Thanks, Dave. Uh, I just had a quick question. Um, you have this extensive background of, you know, this amazing experience of leading SEAL teams, right? And they are a very special group of people. And now you are leading normal people, right? Doing like, you know, simpler jobs. Uh, I'm sure the challenges that you face uh, are likely different in these two worlds. Uh, I just wanted to see how you compare and contrast. What are the things that are easier to do in the, like, let's say the civilian world versus like, you know, the highly trained SEAL world and what are more difficult? Yeah, well, the, thanks for your question. Uh, the first thing I learned was whenever the premise of a question is wrong, don't answer it. And uh, in, in SEALs are normal too. So, uh, you know, the, the embedded in there. The, so the, the kind of tongue in cheek and a little bit flippant, but the point that I, I really would draw from that is the answer to your question, which is as soon as you think you're better than anybody else on the planet, then you're, you've immediately lost the ability to, to perform, to do the best thing that you possibly can for your organization or the people around you. So I think the, when, when it, you know, now leading what you describe as normal people it's really just understanding what people are motivated by and triggered by, you know, it, it's it, it, at the end of the day, people are motivated by roughly the, some combinations of very few things, you know, uh, leadership opportunities, compensation, public recognition, you know, learning quality of life, just to name five, right? If we named five more, you'd probably capture the almost the universal set of what people are motivated by. And so it's understanding who is motivated by what, and then how do you connect that to the, the outcome that you're trying to achieve because a lot of times the people that you're working with can't see the path, the connection between what motivates them and that outcome. And it's helping give them that clarity from, from one to the other. And then also take the inverse of that with triggers and things that frustrate people. There are a lot of, you know, again, I said I'm 49, but like some of the people who are maybe in their younger twenties, you know, they, they like, they, they want a life coach, you know, like I, I want no management. Like when people over my shoulder, Greg, Greg knows this and uh, you know, I, I like room to run and, and have oxygen to breathe. And sometimes that was a little stifling at Bridgewater, but, um, but that's, that's where I do best. And it's understanding and appreciating that not everybody's the same. Like, I don't want to be, the, I don't want to be the life coach to the, you know, I want to help, but I, I just, I, I don't want to, I don't, you have to try it. It's the agility point of understanding what people want and need, and then doing your best to be that as long as that answer isn't sacrificing the overall goals of the organization. Okay, Mike, we're, we're winding down. I got two, uh, two, two more questions for you and I'll take, take the liberty of asking them, but I think they connect to what, what many of us have on our minds. Um, you talked a lot about meaning and uh, you know, I agree with Greg. One of the things that I, I admired about you, I always admired about you, is that you you seem to have a clear sense of where you're headed and what um, what makes you happy and where you know where you find fulfillment. Talk a little bit about finding meaning and how that's evolved for you, and you know wh where you find your purpose. Well, it, it sounds like I've probably confused everybody during this talk that I actually know what I'm talking about because I don't. I'm as lost as the next person, you know. And so the um, I think it's always the journey. And and like if you said, what am I going to be when I grow up? I literally never have like a plan and work backward in this thing that I'm going to go do. I just kind of have this life of like, how do I lean in as much as I can and go continue to build that foundation? Look, I, I, I like I actually learned this one from our mutual friend Frank D'Souza. The statement is all I have in life is varying levels of ignorance about everything, you know? And so when you start with that approach, then, um, then it, it kind of frees you to say, well, gosh, I'm not sure how I'm going to contribute. I, I, I know that I want to contribute, but I know that I also, um, man alive, I, I, I don't have it figured out. I don't sit here and it, it, I, like unashamedly or, or um, so I, I wish I could give an answer of what I'm trying to be when I grow up. I just don't know. Um, I, I just think things like the book though, are more of a, uh, living a life of giving back and, and influence positively impacting others. Like when I wrote to be a white house fellow, one of the hardest things is those 200 word essays, the thousand word essays are easy, but when every word counts, you have to crunch it all. And I still remember my answer to one of those questions of like, why do you want to be a white house fellow? 
it was, I don't want to just positively impact the world. I want to positively impact others to positively impact the world. And then you get that, you build that nonlinear effect on making this nation great. Our institutions are way more fragile than people appreciate. And a lot of us, you know, when we were growing up, it takes people like us now to solidify and strengthen the, those institutions that we all live in. Um, never enough. Um, where did the title come from? And um, how did you, how did you come across it? And, uh, and a final word to our uh, adoring fans here who are happy to have you back for the day. Well, um, never enough is intentionally provocative because people start thinking, oh, fame, fortune, I'm not enough, et cetera. The publisher was initially like, oh, I hate this title. We're definitely not using that. And I said, no, 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 no. Like you, you, it's, it's about meaning and impact. And so that's how, that's, that was the thinking of it. And it's from saying things like I said earlier, you're only excellent if you know you're never excellent enough. Strike the word excellent in fr- and just take the never X enough, you know? And, and so that's really like the philosophy in life, which ties really nicely, right? To the Bridgewater, just the way of being, if you will. But the, um, and then the shameless plug, look, I appreciate all the help I can get. I, again, I'm donating all my profits from this thing. So like, no, like with the word of mouth and the, uh, I'm of course in, in helping spread that, whether it, it's, it's just, it's just greatly appreciated. Like I, I, you know, I didn't, you know, tell you about all the, the, you know, anyways, we all carry different weights in life and, and, um, you know, the ability to fly down and, 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 uh, I've done the, to see a widow who's lost her husband and, and, um, and, and, uh, and, and be able to tell her she's got no more mortgage is some of the, I've done it five times now. I'm actually this week paying off a mortgage for a lady who lost her husband in Afghanistan and then just lost her business in the beginning of the pandemic. They've got four kids and they were homeless. And so, um, you know, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, we were able to tell her she was getting a home and now we're closing on it in a couple of days. And, um, and so that's what my, my 501c3 does. And, um, and uh, so anyways, that, with that, I really do appreciate br- the Bridgewater ecosystem and family's support to give this momentum and get it out there. But I would say only do it if you really read it and think it's great, because I'm quite confident that, uh, that you'll find it, find it solid. Great. We're proud of you, man. Thank you. Thanks for coming back. Good, you, <laughs> good luck with, good luck with the book. And, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep, we'll keep tabs on how it's going and, uh, we'll invite you back soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dave. Right. Thank you, Greg. Thank you uh, to the entire Bridgewater family.